Hi, Paul here from Easy Composites, and today I'm going to be showing you the incredibly simple but fairly crude method that I've used to create this one-off prototype. Now, traditionally in composites, you would start out by creating a pattern of the shape that you want. You would then use that pattern to create a set of molds, and then you would use those molds to create your final part. And that's how you will have seen us make components in most of our previous videos. But in this video, we're going to be using a moldless construction method, which is really simple. What we're going to be doing is shaping foam into the form that we want, and then wrapping several layers of carbon reinforcement over this foam, coating that with resin, flattening it out level and smooth, remove the foam, and then polishing it up to the final result that you see here. The reason that you might use this moldless method over the traditional pattern mold and molding really comes down to time and expense. Creating a one-off part like this using this method really is quite inexpensive and fast by comparison. It also has the advantage that you don't need any specialist tools or equipment. You just need a suitable working environment and the right materials. Now, the results that you're going to get won't rival a molded part in either strength weight or accuracy. But as you can see here, the results still are very viable. And so for one-off components, it might be a very practical method to use. The particular project that we're doing in this video is this half-scale model of an efficiency racer. This is a sort of thing that you would see in the Shelly Marathon or Green Power Race series. But of course, the process isn't limited to making parts only like this and could be used for almost anything you could imagine. Whether that's custom car bodywork, motorcycle fairings or canoes, it really doesn't have any limitations. Let's now get started and make the foam former. The first thing I need to do for that is cut some panels of standard polystyrene insulation in such a way that it will allow me to assemble a block which is slightly larger than the part I want. Now that I've got the sheets of polystyrene cut, I can bond them together into one solid block. To do that, I'm going to be using Gorilla Glue, which is an expanding polyurethane adhesive. This type of adhesive is particularly well suited to this application because it forms a foam when it cures, and that'll sand and shape in with the rest of the foam really easily. I'm sure there are other brands out there, it's just that this is one that you can find almost everywhere. Now to apply it, it's really straightforward. It's just apply a film over the surface, spread it out, and mist that with water. The water just accelerates the curing. Then we can stack the layers of foam together, put some weights on top, and leave it to set up. The foam's now bonded together so I can get on and start creating the shape itself. Now, in the interest of keeping this project as simple as possible, I've just got some basic cardboard templates of the side view and the top view of the model I want to create, which I'm going to mark up and then just hand saw out. Of course, if you did have the facilities, you could just CNC machine this directly. Alternatively, you might choose a hybrid approach of creating section views, filling this with foam and shaping it in, which is a similar method than you will have seen us using in some of our pattern making videos. So as I say, we're keeping things simple in this project, so let's get this marked up. You may be wondering why our foam is gray. I chose this as our local builders merchants had it and I thought it would show up better on camera, but otherwise it is exactly the same as the white foam that you would normally find. Clearly, this foam cuts really quickly just using a handsaw. It will also hot wire cut very well. However, do remember that the hot wire will not cut through the adhesive. I also find that it leaves a hard skin on the surface, which can be a problem if you need to sand it. But for shapes without double curvature, like a straight or tapered airfoil, it might be a fast and clean tool to use if you have one. So I've now got the foam roughly shaped, but to get these two profiles really accurate, I'm going to use the other side of the cardboard template that I've made and then sand in until I've got a really close fit. And I'm going to do this before we start bringing in the compound curves. The refinement of the shape can be done by hand with sandpaper on a block, or like I'm doing here, using an orbital sander with a fairly coarse 120 grit pad. Here, I'm also using the extraction on the sander, which does make the sanding surprisingly clean. Now that we've got these main profiles cut and sanded in, you can really see that the shape is starting to take form. Now, from this point forward now, I'm going to be working freehand and just shaping the compound curves in by eye. But of course, if you did need a higher degree of accuracy, you could make yourself some reference profiles and work to those. When sanding forms like this, you do need to take your time and slowly work it into the final shape. 
you should regularly check the form both by eye and feel. I find that by running my hand over the surface, I can often pick up unevenness that can't easily be seen. Getting this shape as accurate and consistent as possible is very important as this creates the foundation for the rest of the process and any faults on the surface here will carry through and cause you more problems down the line. After finishing with the power sander, some hand sanding will help to get into all the small details and finish the surface more finely. Now that I'm completely happy with the shape that I've got in the former, I can go on and apply a release film over the surface. Without this release film, the resin would adhere onto the foam, it would get into all of the porosity, and that would make extracting the foam later on much more difficult. So it is very important to have a release barrier like this. To apply the release film, it's really straightforward, I'm just going to be using a conventional spray adhesive. The particular spray adhesive that I'm using here is Super 77 from 3M, but I'm sure that most general purpose ones would also work fine. I have found that a release film coating like this is the quickest and most reliable way to get a clean release from the polystyrene. Conventional release agents like wax and PVA simply don't work on the porous surface and will still allow the resin to bite into the foam, making the removal incredibly difficult. The release film is the same film that we would normally use in vacuum bagging prepreg materials. It has good elongation and can be made to follow quite complex shapes. When you're applying this, don't worry if you get a few small creases, the film is very thin so it won't really influence the final layup. Any joints that you may have in the film can be simply secured using some flash release tape. We're now ready to get started with the layup. Because of the shape of this particular part, I am going to need to do this in two stages. So I'll be laminating the underside, allowing this to cure, flipping it over and doing the top. But of course, for many projects, you could do this in just one single step. Now the first layer that you'll see me put down will be a peel ply. And the reason I'm doing that is it provides a very smooth, consistent inside surface, and one that you could subsequently easily bond to if you're adding additional bulkheads or reinforcement on the inside of the part. But it isn't absolutely necessary, and you could at this stage go directly on with the carbon. I just find it provides a nicer finish. Here I'm just marking out and cutting the peel ply to size. Then I can use this as a template for the carbon fibre. I'm aiming for a finished panel thickness of approximately one millimetre. So three layers of 210 gram 22 twill will provide this in a hand layup. The resin can then be mixed. We're using the EL2 hand laminating resin. Typically in hand layup, the fabric will use about its own weight in resin. So if you have 500 grams of cloth, you will use about 500 grams of resin. The hardness should be accurately measured and thoroughly mixed to ensure it's completely blended. When doing a hand layup like this, you should normally aim to drive the resin up through the laminate. So here, I'm applying the resin onto the former and then laying down the peel ply, ensuring that this is wetted out, and then repeating later with the reinforcement. Each ply having the resin applied first and then being worked up through the fabric. Alongside the brush, there are a few tools that can help in this process. A spreader or a squeegee will quickly drive the resin through the fibre and help to level it. In some cases, a thinned roller might also prove useful for the same reason. What you're looking to achieve is to have wetted out the cloth enough for it to have fully saturated, but not so much that there is a wet film of resin over the surface. The fabric can be trimmed if required. I have a separate pair of shears which I reserve for wet work like this. I do always clean them with acetone after use, but they're never quite as perfect as my dry shears. With the first layup cured, I can now go on and prepare this for the second layup. To do that, I'm just going to denib all the way around the edge and get rid of any of these sharp spots that we've got. And I'll also key all the way around the perimeter. The reason why I'm going to do that is because when we do the second layup, it's going to lap over the top of this one. And by keying that area, I will ensure that we're going to get a really good bond between the two halves. Again, I'm using the 120 grit Abronet Ace pads in the sander but to be honest, it would be almost as quick to do this part by hand. I'm now ready to continue on with the second layup. Now I will be doing this in much the same way as I did the layup on the underside. The main difference that you're going to see though is that I'm using slightly oversized pieces of material, then I'm going to wet them out and tailor them in on the job. 
The reason I'm doing it this way is it will give me a bit more margin for error on the initial placement and also when you cut the fabric when it's wetted out it doesn't fray as easily as it would when it's dry so it does provide a neater cut line. The next batch of EL2 resin needs measuring and mixing and then the plies laminating just as we did on the underside. You will find that peel ply doesn't drape quite as well as carbon fibre does and so you may need to cut and overlap this in areas to prevent it from creasing. Once wetted out, this can then be trimmed back, but to allow the two sides to bond properly, it's very important that this stops short of and does not overlap the reinforcement on the underside. To place the carbon neatly, I've roped in our cameraman Kyle to assist, and then we've carefully draped the fabric over the former. This will then be wetted out and laminated just as we did on the underside. This process can be used for almost any reinforcement type, including glass, aramid and carbon. If you want to learn more about different fabric types, please have a look through some of our other videos where we cover them in detail. You might be wondering whether this part could be vacuum bagged or even infused onto the former. Well, if you're using a polystyrene former, the simple answer is no. Even at low levels of vacuum, the foam will collapse slightly, leading to distortion. There are ways around this using different materials for the former or laying a base ply, but in this video it's all about keeping things simple, so we won't touch on those. I'm going to leave this now to cure for 24 hours. When I come back I'm going to start denibbing and sanding the surface in preparation for the resin coating. With the part now cured, we can start sanding the carbon. We're using a 120 grit pad and again using vacuum on our sander, which captures nearly all of the dust at source. At this stage of sanding, we're not looking to flatten the surfaces, but simply to remove any small high spots and provide an overall key. If you are using a power sander, you might still find that bit of hand keying will still be needed in some of the low areas or finer details. After sanding, the part should be wiped down to remove any dust. I've now denibbed and sanded the entire surface of the part. You will see that I am still left with some waves and ripples in the carbon from the drape of the material. Now that is completely normal when you're doing an open layup like this, but I can't at this stage go in and try and level and flat those out. The reason is that the carbon's only quarter of a millimeter thick per layer, so I'd very quickly sand through those layers, which would compromise it both aesthetically and structurally. So instead, what we need to do is apply a coating onto the surface that we can then flat and level out. Now, if you were just going for a painted surface, so losing the carbon appearance, what I would do at this stage is use a fine surface filler, the same as you would use for car paint prep, skim that over the surface, then level, sand that smooth, and apply your final paint finish. But if you do want to retain the carbon appearance, what we need to do is use a clear coating. So we're going to be using the XCR coating resin, which is specifically designed for coating applications like this. The reason you would choose to use a coating resin over a laminating resin is that it finishes with a much nicer, glossier surface finish, which is very easy to sand and polish. It also has better UV stability. So we're going to be going on and applying two or three applications of this to build up the thickness that we need to allow me to level into the surface and give us a completely flat finish. The XCR is accurately weighed and thoroughly mixed as we did with the EL2, but this time at a different ratio. The ratios of resin to hardener are always printed on our containers, and so it's always worth carefully checking these to prevent any mistakes. Applying the coating resin is really straightforward, it's just like applying a gloss paint, so it's a nice even thin coat over the surface, and you're just looking to get as thick a coat as you can before it wants to start to drain, so you'll find that's typically around about three to 500 grams per square meter. So that's the first coat applied. I'm now going to leave this to get to a B stage, which is the point where it's slightly tacky before going on and applying the next coat. It will vary depending on room temperature, but typically it's going to take around about three hours. So here we are at the B stage, and you can see that my glove is slightly tacking to the resin, but the resin is not moving or coming away. This is the right point to continue. So another batch of resin is mixed and the process repeated.
Now that our coats of resin have fully cured, we can get on and start flatting and leveling this surface. So we'll be sanding into this resin coating and taking out any of these ripples and irregularities that we've got. To do that, I'm just going to be using a fairly coarse 120 grit abrasive in the DA sander. After the sanding, I'm really pleased with how flat and even the surface of this part is. You will notice that I have broken through into the carbon fibre in one or two areas. So before I can polish this, I will need to apply one more thin coat of resin. And what that will do is give me a consistent resin film that I can then go on and fine sand and polish up to the final finish. That's our final coat of resin cured off, and as you can see, we're already starting to get a really good finish on this part. But to get rid of the last little ripples, waves, and nibs that are left from the coating process, I am going to go on and do another round of flatting and polishing. But because we do have this quite even substrate to work from, I can start out with a finer abrasive. So I'll be starting out with a 400 grit, then working through the grades up to 2000, before going on and compound polishing this up to its final gloss. In case you haven't already worked this out, yes, this way of making carbon fiber parts does involve a lot of sanding, probably about four hours total in this project, and you could easily double that if you were hand sanding. This round of sanding starts at 400 grit, and this very quickly levels out the nibs and can be used to slightly refine any slight irregularities in the surface curves. After the 400 grade, we move on to the 800. Here, I'm using a foam interface pad, as this will increase the contact area on compound curves, which will improve the coverage and reduce the risk of missing areas. From this grade onwards, all we're looking to do is remove the scratches caused by the previous grade, so it's simply a case of methodically working over the surface. On this part, it takes about 10 minutes per grade, after the 800 grit Abronet, I'm moving on to the 1000 grit Abrolon. Now these pads have their own foam backing, so they don't need the interface pad. The 1000 is then followed by the final 2000 grit. On these finer grades, misting the part with water can help to keep the pads free from clogging and continuing to cut very effectively. The last step is to polish out the fine 2000 grit scratches. For this, we're first using the NW1 polishing compound, which is applied sparingly onto the part and then buffed using a soft foam pad on a rotary polisher. When doing this, make sure to keep the polisher moving to avoid getting any areas too hot. You can occasionally feel the surface to check this. It's okay if it feels slightly warm, but anything more than this and you should stop and allow it to cool before continuing. The NW1 comes in black and white. For carbon, I tend to use black as any residue that might be left on trimmed edges or in any fine pinholes will blend in. This compound is what's known as self-diminishing, meaning that the more you work it, the finer the polish it offers. And for most applications, I would say that this is the only compound you would need. But if you do want to take it one step further, then you can enhance the gloss even further using the top finish too, which is applied and buffed in just the same way. So that's our final surface finish. All that's left to do now is give it a trim around the wheel wells, cut out the access hatch, and then remove the foam from the inside. I've marked out a line and I'm cutting out the hatch using a 19 mm permagrit wheel. The wheel wells are then exposed by sanding them down with a flap wheel in a grinder. The hatch can then be carefully moved with a plastic spatula and then the foam dug out. Now, there is no art to this. Sure, you could dissolve it with solvent, but that would leave you with a highly flammable mess, so instead it's just a case of tearing into it with scrapers and chisels. Of course, this is only necessary if the foam has become mechanically trapped. For many projects, you will have a positive draft angle, so the part could simply be lifted off from the form. Once the foam is removed, the release film and peel ply will easily tear from the surface, which leaves a really neat B-side to the part, and this is also ready for any bonding that you might need to do. To create the rebate for the hatch, I'm using some VM100 adhesive to bond some 3 quarter millimeter thick carbon fiber sheet around the lip. To finish the project, a coloured section is vinyl wrapped and the decals are applied. 
So here we have our finished bodywork. As I'm sure you'll agree, the results that we've managed to achieve from this humble process really are quite impressive. And I think to the untrained eye, you probably couldn't tell the difference between this and a conventionally molded part. But on close inspection, there are a few telltale giveaways. You may have noticed earlier on while we were polishing that there are some ripples in the reflection in the carbon. Now that's not on the surface of the part. The surface is actually very flat. We've got a coat of resin over there. But underneath where the fabric's been draped over the foam former, it won't be as flat as it would be as if it was molded and held against the flat surface of the mold. So it does catch the light and create these irregular reflections in the surface. We also have a few areas where we've broken through the top layer of reinforcement. This problem occurs when you have any slight high spots in that foam former underneath. And that means that when you're sanding it, it is very easy to quickly break through those high spots. Now, in the case of this part, although we have slightly compromised the performance, it's not going to have a major influence. Then, of course, there is the weight. This particular part weighs in at 3.15 kilograms. And if this had been a pre-preg or a resin infused part, I would have expected it to come in at more like 1.8. So this, although it still is lightweight, is significantly heavier than using those other methods. Now, even with those things considered, I think you'll agree that the results that we've got here would be more than good enough for many one-off and prototype applications. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and for those of you who are maybe putting off starting your composite project because of the complexity of making the mold, that this has shown that there is an alternative method that will get you to your one-off or prototype part. Now, if you do want to give this process a go, remember that most of the materials we've been using are available on the Easy Composites website. And while you're on there, check out our learning area where we have support material for this video and all of our other videos, and also, occasionally, you might get a sneak peek of a video before we release it on YouTube. As ever, I'd like to send a huge thank you to all of our customers and subscribers for your support, and we'll see you in the next one. All of the equipment and materials that you've seen used in this video can be ordered online from the Easy Composites website. If you're based in the EU, you can now order directly from our Netherlands warehouse on easycomposites.eu. And for the UK and the rest of the world, please visit easycomposites.co.uk.